Okay, we're good to go. Hi, um, my name is uh, Precht van Lommel. I'm one of the Blender developers, and I'm going to talk about uh, user interface stuff. Um, first, I'll talk a bit about uh, some of the UI issues, sort of from a developer point of view. Andrew sort of approached it from like for a complete beginner, and I'll sort of approach it from having worked on the user interface and sort of encounter things which didn't actually fit in the 2.5 design or which we sort of later found out we didn't really have a plan for and we, we, which we had to sort of adapt and which are now, you know, kind of shaky. After that, I'll talk a bit about how I plan to organize the UI team, the process uh, for UI design, and then we'll do some questions. Um, Okay, so there's like lots of well-known topics like left mouse button, right mouse button, all this stuff, but I'm not going to talk about this um, because everybody knows about this. Um, so, okay. So one of the powerful things about the Blender user interface is that you can divide your screen into all these different editors and um, it's really flexible. You can like combine different workflows. But it also has some issues. Um, one of those, for example, is the uh, is the redo panel. Like on the lower left, there's nothing in there in the screenshot, but it has um, it has like the settings of the last executed operator. And this is in the 3D view, but actually, any operator that you execute goes there. So even if you do something in the UV editor or the sequencer editor, it somehow ends up being in the 3D view panel, which is kind of weird. And we have a few more of those things which are actually kind of global, but they're sort of pushed into each individual editor because that's the way Blender is organized in like in these individual mini applications. And so um, on that part, we, we haven't really yet found like a good solution to um, make a good separation between the stuff that's sort of more global and local and we sort of hack around it and this would be good to clarify uh, at some point. Um, I'm just, I'm going to talk about like the, the issues mostly and maybe pro some solutions, but it's mostly like pointing out issues and then, uh, you know, maybe people can start thinking about them. So, and the other thing is that the editors can be sort of a bit antisocial. Like, they don't always co cooperate well together. For example, if you have the outliner and you have a material there and you double click the material, it does nothing because it doesn't really understand, like, how do I open this material? It doesn't really know that it could perhaps in the properties editor open the material tab and show you the material, which would be, you know, very convenient, but they don't, the editors don't always talk to each other very well. Or like if you have a driver on a property and you want to edit a driver, then you have to go into the graph editor and then you have to select drivers and find your property and then go into the panel. And it's like you have these individual editors and it should be easy if you have like a little driver on a property to say just I want to edit this, but it doesn't actually, the editors are not really talking to each other. You sort of have to piece it together. And this is sort of one of those things where the multi-editor concept is kind of weak and where we, I think we have to, uh, have, to, have to improve a bit. Even though, of course, it's a very powerful thing to be able to arrange things, it's, it doesn't always like work together. Um, another thing is that, of course, we have the non-modal, non-overlapping paradigm where you don't uh, have like too much blocking uh, dialogues or you don't have too many overlapping things. But there's a few issues with this. Like if you have a modal dialogue, for example, and you want to edit a property like in Microsoft Word, you want to edit like the page margins or something. You open the dialogue, you edit them, you close them, and then it's out of the way, you know? Okay, it's kind of annoying because it's modal because you might have gone back and forth and like open the panel like a dozen times before you get it right. but once you're done, it's like it's out of the way, whereas in Blender, you open a panel and it kind of stays there and you're sort of responsible for cleaning it up. And like I see a lot of files, blend files coming and they have like 
like 80% of their screen is covered in buttons. And I'm like, why, why isn't, you know, I have the tendency to clean that stuff up, but somehow the way it's, it's organized, you, you have like, you just keep adding buttons and, and stuff. And, and, and it would be nice if we have some sort of system to keep the interface more tidy in a way that's sort of automatic or that hints the user that they can close something or I'm not exactly what, sure what the solution is, but there's like a few nice paradigms in some other applications that we could perhaps use there. And the other thing is, of course, like you, you always have like more information than you can display. And there's like different solutions to it. You can have, of course, scrolling, you can have tabs, you can have overlapping things. And in some cases, like we're not really using, I think, the right the right choice of those three. Like in reality, you're always going to have to make a trade-off. But for example, if you look in the 3D view, you have like the object properties, which is something that people want to keep open, whereas like the, the, the other properties of the 3D view, like, you know, maybe the display properties, it's something that you would maybe like want to open, click, and then and it hides again so that it's sort of out of the way that you don't always have like those 3D view properties showing while you, you maybe want to have your, um, your object properties persistent. And so I think we have to think a bit about um, instead of like having everything open and having everything like on the side scrolling, we should think about maybe moving some, some parts of the interface into sort of a into dialogues that you can open and then close again, and then it's sort of, you know, that is, we, and those dialogues then are maybe a bit, you could call them overlapping, but sometimes I think it's good to have, you know, things that you temporarily uh, edit and then close again so that it doesn't clutter up the interface. And I think we sort of should evaluate, like, for each part of Blender, like, should it really be a persistent thing that always shows, or should it be, like, a temporary thing that you open and close again? Another thing is, like, the way Blender organizes data is um, kind of non-standard, although maybe some other applications do it. Like, the main, the main difference with, like, Maya or Houdini or... Um, XSI, for example, the way you access da data there is often you have like a graph or you have a tree structure and you just double click on some data and it shows you the properties of that data. Like, there's like one properties window. And in Blender, it's kind of the other way around. Like you have to go to an editor and then find your data there. And then if you have another editor, you have to go find your data there again sometimes. And it's it would be for new users at least, or even for existing users, it would be nice if you could just click on data in the outliner and it would show you the, the properties of that data instead of having to know, like, where do I find this data? Like, so, um, and then there's like a, a second issue, which is kind of a bit more obscure, but the, in Blender, we sort of have this, what I call an active data tree where you have at the root, you have like the active scene and then you have an active object, you have an active world and the active object has an active material and has an active texture and then that has an image. And for example, when you're painting in the, in the 3D viewport, it's that image, but users don't really know always that it's like that image because there's like such a long change, chain of like things that define it and it's not communicated very well. And it also gets confusing, like if you have a texture on a material and a texture on a world, like which texture are you editing in the texture editor? And so because we have this, this concept of always showing the active data in the properties editor instead of something that you just clicked in the outliner, things can get very confusing. And um, I think we should probably think about, you know, how we can solve that kind of um, how we can clarify that, because this is one of those things that we never really discussed for 2.5, like how do you determine what gets shown in every editor? But it's very, uh, it's very important. And you also have things like the animation editors. They have their own idea about selection, and then it sort of syncs with other selection, and it's kind of confusing. So the way you decide which data you display where is, is quite confusing and we also need like a, a more uh, consistent way to deal with this. 
Um, okay, then we have tools, and there's like some ridiculous things in tools that, um, with the current toolbar, for example, like if you if you click the the translate button in the toolbar, it's basically useless because the translate tool depends on the mouse position. And if you click it, your mouse position is like way too far and you cannot actually move the object in any useful way. And there's like a bunch of tools like this in the toolbar, which don't actually fit with the way the tools work. Like the, the, the way the tools are designed, they're not designed to be put in a toolbar. And um, I think if we're going to add a toolbar, we, we're going to have to think about, you know, how can we actually make them work well when you put them in a toolbar? There's a few other things like, for example, in Andrew's proposal, there was a global toolbar, but that's kind of against Blender's philosophy because if you have multiple 3D editors open, perhaps with like multiple different layers visible in each, and it's not clear like in which of the 3D view editors are you going to apply the tool. So that's one of those things that we have to really um, Think about if we're going to add a toolbar. Like, how do you, how does a tool behave if you click on it from a toolbar? Because right now, the way the toolbar works in, for like interactive tools, especially, it's it's very confusing. Um, yeah, and this is basically what Andrew talked about. Like, a lot of stuff is difficult to find. I'm not going to give you more examples of this because I think Andrew Andrew's UI proposal sort of explained this better. Like, we could have have tabs. At the top of the screen, like we have screen layouts to just easier find them, find them easy, more easily because like right now, there's like a big default button at the top and no one knows like default, what does that mean? Is that, a, you know, how can you even guess that's a screen layout? And that's sort of one of those things that we should evaluate, like how can you easily find the tool? And I think if you had at least this as tabs and give them some useful names, then I think it would be easier for users to actually find the tools. But there's lots of things that um, that could be improved here. But um, I think this part is kind of abstract, but I'll get, I'll just go over to like how I, I plan to um, organize the new UI, well, the design process for, uh, for the UI. So, um, one of the problems we have right now with UI design is that there isn't any person um, who has both the time and the authority to make difficult decisions. And there's also not really a good process to involve experienced users in design. I know there's module teams, but I think we can improve that in some ways. And as a result, there's like lots of discussion about UI design, not even, not even like counting about the stuff that was in the recent weeks, but also like on the mailing lists before and then the bug trackers. And then at the end, there's like no decision because there's no person who says, who makes a decision. And this is discouraging for new developers because they cannot get patches approved and it's discouraging for existing developers because you know, you don't want to start working on something when you're not really sure if people are going to be happy with it or if people are going to back you up when you make any decisions. So, um, the solution to this. Um, of course, we already have module teams for like different areas of Blender, um, which is a mix of experienced developer, of developers and experienced users. But the UI team at this moment is kind of non-existent. I mean, of course, the people involved in it, like me and Ton, and we're, we're still here, but like we're not actively working on it, and Ton is too busy with other things, and it's kind of non-existent at the moment. So the first thing, uh, the first plan is to re-establish this team. So um, there's probably going to be about two or three or maybe four people who are going to lead this. Um, and they're going to make the final decisions. So it's not going to be designed by committee. It's going to be like a few people, and they make the final decisions. Um, if there's any, you know, if there's an obviously good solution, then of course they would follow that solution. But if there's like a difficult decision and people don't agree, then we need like two or three people who can make decision. And probably that UI team is going to be me and two other people or three other people. Um, we're not sure yet. Um, 
we'll try to figure that out soon. And of course, the thing is, it's not because those two or three people will be making the, the final decisions. We, that, that that's all the people that are going to be working on it. It's we want it to be like an open process where everyone can, you know, submit designs and 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 you know implement features. But we just need a few people to make the difficult decisions. So um, the other part is. Uh, how we are going to do this, uh, how, are, you know, how the, the process is going to work. So one, one part is that we're going to have this new developer.blender.org website, which we're working on. Um, <clears throat> and that's uh, that on that website, we're not only going to do bug tracking and uh, you know, all, the, all the stuff that we usually don't do on there, like patch review, but I also want to do there design and uh, make design tasks for specific issues like left mouse versus right click or you know confirm on quit or how do you design a toolbar and all those kinds of design issues i want to um instead of having them sort of desi decided in emails between between uh, people in private emails or on irc or whatever i would like all these design decisions and all this communication to be out in the public. Because um, <clears throat> Andrew mentioned there's like a, a big gap between developers and users. And I think this is actually true to an extent because there, there is the developers only really communicate most with like a sort of set of privileged users that they know and that they or is often see on IRC and you know, that they know are experienced in something and they will talk to them, but there's no public record of it. And so as an outsider, I think it's very difficult to see what's going on or to sort of jump into the process. And I would like these sort of design decisions to be pushed sort of into the, uh, the public website where you can see the discussion, where you can see the reasoning. And I hope that this way sort of we can sort of uh, make the gap between the users and the developers smaller because right now there is of course interaction with users but not with all users and it's very difficult to jump in so okay in practice i think we're going to have a few rules to start with like one is of course developers they can open design tasks if they're going to implement something to get feedback from users like even before you submit a patch, I want developers to be able to open a design task, get feedback from UI designers, um, from users, and then sort of establish a design and then implement it when it's sort of approved by the UI team instead of implementing it first and then having it rejected. So um, hopefully that will be a bit less discouraging then and then we can uh, you know, get get issues solved before people waste their time. The other thing is that on a new website, you'll be able to like uh, CC other people to uh, to a design task or a bug or something. So if if someone adds a patch for the animation system, we can CC all the animation system experienced users, and then they can check on it, and then we can get reviewed that way. Because right now, in the way the bug tracker or the patch tracker works, it's it's not easy. There's no really, not really a system to like call all, everyone who's, who has a stake in it together to that report, you know. So it would, in that way, we can, you know, involve the module teams more. And the other thing is like I don't want this to be sort of a feature request thing yet, because if everyone starts submitting feature requests like right away after the conference or something, we're gonna have like. 200 design things to discuss, and we're not going to get anything done. So for now, I think only the, the UI team leads will add a few design things to discuss, like maybe left mouse versus right mouse, and then try to figure those things out and see how it goes. And then, you know, then we can maybe think about opening it up more. Um, so that's sort of the idea of, of how things would interact. Um, yeah, this is a, a screenshot of the new website. It's not very, it's, I think it's a bit more inviting than the old websites. It's got like a white background, which is a bit less scary. Um, 
but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get the website open and you know we'll explain how it works on some on some page. Um, okay. So basically, the goal of each design task is going to be that you get some sort of complete design of how the feature works. I mean, I'm not talking about like a formal UML diagram thing or some boring thing, but you know, we have to have a good idea of how the feature works. And then the UI module team can officially reject it or approve it. And then the developer knows, okay, I can, I can you know, they can start implementing it. And um, I'm probably going to sort of moderate it very strictly. Like, no, you know, it's not going to be like plus one, plus one, plus one, or oh, this is terrible, or, you know, I'm pro probably going to try to moderate it so that, you know, we have like constructive feedback and, you know, discussion with proper arguments and such, you know, not like one of those forum threads that, that spins out of control. Um, so that's sort of the plan. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe I'm going a bit fast. Let's see how much time I have. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is like the decision on, on, on the design task is not going to be voting. So, you know, it's going to be like the UI team leaders of if, if it's an animation system thing, maybe the animation system people decide. Um, and I think that way we, we're going to have like a list of approved features in the tracker with uh, like a specification of how it should work. And I hope that for existing and new developers, this will sort of be more, uh, you know, it's like going to be more clear, like, oh, I can implement this. It's, it's approved. If I do it right, then, you know, it's probably more inviting than starting work on a feature where you're not quite sure how it should work. So hopefully we get more developers that way, because actually, Getting enough developers, I fear, is going to be the most difficult issue because there's like lots of suggestions, but we have to have motivated developers as well. Um, yeah. So the website is not actually running yet, um, but I'll probably announce something in one or two weeks um, about how this is going to work and who is going to be in the UI module team and. I guess you'll find it on the mailing lists and on Blender Nation and, you know. So if you're interested in joining, just keep an eye on it or maybe talk to me, you know, this weekend. And um, <clears throat> then we can hopefully get this UI project sort of running again. Um, yeah, questions? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, like. If we're going to do questions, I would like to talk about how to organize things or get the project going or maybe have ideas to get funding or something, but I would rather not, you know, have like one feature request after the other because it's not really going to uh, be useful. Oh, hello. So I know that um, in a discussion between myself and Tan, actually, at some point, uh, it had been mentioned whether or not to basically to do the, the UI lead kind of as a sprint project over just a short amount of time and try and make a lot of progress quickly, or else to do it as kind of an ongoing thing. What, what are the plans as far as, for like the UI team, is this something that you think will be kind of ongoing that just slowly kind of tackle things and this will be kind of a permanent team? or? the team itself be permanent, not necessarily the members of the team? Uh, or is it more of a, a quick project to try and make some, some fairly significant changes and then move on? I mean, we, we might do a sprint or something at some point. I haven't really discussed this with Tom if we have some way to organize it. But it definitely has to be something that's ongoing because there's constantly new features being added to Blender and patches submitted. And basically, we need people who can you know, if a new patch comes in, they can give feedback on it. They can give suggestions. Um, like, we cannot really predict which patches we're going to get, which functionality is going to contribute it. And like, almost every feature, well, not, all, not every feature, but a lot of features touch the user interface. So 
you know, the user interface team or other people who are like the lead or other people who, f who feel uh, interested in it, they should be able to, for any new feature that's added, they should be able to comment on it and give suggestions. Like it's, it should be an ongoing thing because uh, almost everything is interface related in some way. So it's definitely ongoing. I mean, I think we shouldn't be getting afraid or like, oh my God, the UI team is going to take over Blender, help, right? Now, what it is, it is about making our development more efficient and make sure that everybody here who wants to be involved can be involved, but also don't lose energy. So the feedback we are going to ask for, what the UI team is going to work with, is on stuff that is going to happen, or stuff that is already being worked on, like as somebody is working on painting tools, uh, on tonish, and he's making decisions all the time. So it's good if some users, or the UI team looks at it, and say, okay, make sure that this and that and that point is being uh, fixed or working or whatever or when he needs feedback that he can directly go to those people and open a design ticket, like I need a decision on uh, the menu position of blah, 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 blah. And if somebody has uh, like the radio menu, yeah, this is a, a patch, it has to be put in uh, the blender code. So you have to you can make a design proposal for how our radio menu is going to work in Blender. Are they going to take over everything? Is it an option? Is it a user pref? So there are so many decisions which are already current to be taken, which is important to organize. So a UI team is about people who have time to be involved and who want to be involved and are interested in helping Blender further. It's not about giving Blender a complete new interface. Right? Yeah. That's another topic. Yeah, I think for some topics, I think we should also be able to like, do the design before there's any developer attached, but only sort of when it's approved by the UI team leaders. Like for example, the left mouse versus right mouse thing, like we might not yet have a developer attached to it, but we know it, we want it to happen soon. So we might figure out the design and then afterwards assign a developer to it. But that's like going to be decided by the UI team and the developers, like what's realistic. And that this discussion was also only about a default, like what right, you give to new people, which is a yeah. very simple decision, really. You don't have well, to discuss long. It's not a simple that. decision, but it's simple to do once it's it's made. <laughs> right, that's right. It's <laughs> easy to do, but a difficult decision. <laughs> Hi, uh, hello. Hi. Uh, have you looked into how other open source projects do uh, handle this kind of situation. I mean, I follow a little bit of Ubuntu. I know they have a more centralized design team. I remember GIMP at some point had uh, someone doing the usability survey. He even came to a conference two years ago to give some pitch on, on his method. Have you looked after that? If uh... Yeah, I have looked at it and it's like, um... It's the, like the, the very technical projects, like Python, for example, they have like PEP proposals that you can make, and then the users can like make very technical proposals. But when it comes to like more user facing applications, there isn't that much public design discussion. It's mostly among developers. Like, I, I, like you have bug trackers, and some people will reply to it, but I don't think a lot of open source projects have like public design decisions about a lot of stuff. I think it's mostly developers making decisions. Um, and I think Blender is, is relatively unique within this open source world because we, uh, we are like in between a very big project and an amateur driven project. Uh, many successful open source projects only have like five developers or three, four or five people. And they happily work together and they do their stuff. Uh, they get users and they work with it or not. And that's how GIMP and Inkscape develop. They do fine, but they're not that weird as this Blender community. Like, we, we have a whole conference of three days only about Blender, right? And everybody has opinions and ideas about it. And Blender is part of your job. You use it full time, you use it to make your living or to do training. So people depend on this program a lot. Yeah. So we have a d weird, different way of working, and so we have to invent it ourselves. Or we have to become a company, like Canonical or 
Uh, like, uh, well, Mozilla is working with this, this big business. Do we want that corporate big stuff? Uh, people with suits next year here telling us what to do. Yeah. So let's, I think we have to experiment a bit here. I think like projects like Inkscape and MyPaint, they sort of do what we do now. They mostly like talk among, among um, experienced users and those people have a lot of influence on design, which is kind of what we're doing now as well. Um, I, I mean, the, the concept of module owners and module teams is common in open source. Uh, Apache is doing it, I know that Python, I think, do that. So that, that make teams, make teams self-supporting and empower them. But it's not interesting to have people meddling with the riggers and how to make uh, good animation tools versus the 3D painters and the sculptors. I mean, there are so many areas in Blender. We have to make sure that they can work. So we have to find some common ground where everybody can work, work together. And there's some overlap. And the UI team can, might, might need to overlap a lot between modules. And I think that will go fine. We've done that already for 10 years. It's only getting more complicated. Well, we organize ourselves a bit better, and we'll see how it goes. Right? Um, many bigger companies or, or parties, if you look at Apple or Microsoft or KDE, they have uh, user interface guidelines. So user interface guidelines. Like they say that a button like this must go there, a button like that must go there. Is it also planned for the UI team to come up with some form of style guide or guideline um, to make it easier to, for developers to get their stuff approved immediately? Uh, I would love that to happen, but um, we, we do I, have I personally don't have time for it at the moment, no. but it would be cool to organize something like this. At the moment, we do have the guidelines for the 2.5 project. There's lots of focus points and there's documents. There's how to design panels and where to locate things. So my suggestion is that the UI team uses the existing guidelines and the existing focus as a starting point and try to work with that. And when they find out that some of our principles are not working anymore, like uh, getting a parallel non-blocking interface or the, that kind of stuff, then you should have a more wider discussion. But then the, the core team or the people who are involved should agree on big changes, bigger things. That's uh, something you can do more carefully. But 95% of the decisions are small ones, really. It's, all, it's not like complicated to handle. Yeah. So yes, I, I would like. To, I would like to see the, the UI team to, to look at the guidelines and make it more presentable and make sure that everybody says, okay, so this is what we stick to. Uh, so we agree on this part, and this is the part we can uh, work in freedom. That's easy to do, to decide. He was first, and then. Lado. Maybe, uh, what about uh, including a, U, a pure UI designer in the UI design team, even if uh, is not able to understand a, a single code line, is not able to code uh, anything, but so, is a pure UI designer? I, I th I'm thinking about this, it's like designing a chair. You, you, you need to have somebody that produces the chair uh, which is the coder and some some uh, other people that put her <laughs> her his uh, his butt on the on the chair, the, which is the user. Between those two people, uh, you yeah. need a, a UI designer, yeah. which I I don't know if uh, you already thought about including. Uh, personally, I would love to have one uh, on the team, but you know where do you find them? Where do you find funding to pay them, or do we find a volunteer? But I, I, I would love to have like an experienced UI designer on the team. Personally, I mean, if they if they have some understanding of Blender and yeah, I mean, if if you think you're like an experienced UI, UI designer, then talk to me and then maybe. I mean, if we, we can, if you look at all the feedback we had in the past weeks and mockups, there were quite good doc, docs and ideas and people who are thinking about usability. 
So if we can focus them a little bit, it might well be possible that the people who want to be involved, but they are not coders, develop into great UI designers. So you cannot pluck them from the air, but from the people who already are involved, uh, are here even, they might develop into the good designers. So let's give them a chance to be involved and evolve. Rather than saying, okay, here is 100,000 euros and, and hire a consultant and who's going to tell us what to do. I, I don't see that useful even. I mean, the same issue is our animation system, right? It's complicated, really difficult to do that. And you say, we should hire somebody to advise our animation system. Now, we get our animators. Then they, they can feedback on this. But they know Blender already as a user. So if an interface designer who doesn't know Blender and who doesn't know 3D tools and who's not even involved with us, how can you ask him to make a design? That will be a very long process for him to understand what we do, or for her. You see? So yeah. I'd rather have somebody standing up here as and say, I'm going to contribute and I will show that I can do this. And it's mostly work, get involved, and be there every day. Also, the thing is, like, initially, I think we'll have like two or three people on, like, as the leaders to make the final decisions, but then if someone starts like doing lots of useful stuff and contributing lots of awesome proposals and designs, then, you know, maybe that person goes onto the design leaders team, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be set in stone. If you find like an awesome UI designer, like in the process, then that person can be, you know, part of the team leaders eventually. So it's it's just like we just start with people that seem reasonable as leaders, and then we see where it goes. I mean, what I'm my personal opinion is that we first need to get more developers who know how to do interactivity coding tool coding, tool design, interface, because otherwise ideas and design will never be realized. The most important thing is get it done first. Once we have more people who can get stuff done, then feedback is also more rewarding and you can do stuff. So let's try to find those developers. Somebody's phoning me. Okay. I think uh, we're going to wrap it up. Or okay. The one of the things I noticed, I worked in the Plone Python community uh, since about 2006, and one of the things that you also discussed the development between UI and developers. Uh, the the communication is very critical regarding adoptability internally and how that affects external. In other words, who's going to adopt Blender? Who's going to get into it because of the usability issues regarding jumping into a new technology? And creating a bridge between the developer community and the UI team is very important because we noticed in Plone Python that this was a very difficult bridge to make and it actually prevented developing the usability, which has now actually become a little bit of a block to the Plone system. And the community is starting to worry about the survivability of Plone right now. But uh, usability is critical, but the developers also have to embrace the concepts because they come from two different paradigms of thought. So yeah. it's, it's a concept that has to sort of like when you're developing the UI team, and if I, by the way, I've worked in schemata design for, for uh, system integration, so if I can help, I will. Uh, but uh, making sure we can create the bridge and make sure both sides are working together can actually help things adopt much faster. Yeah, I mean, I would like the UI team lead to have, I mean, I would be the developer on the team and then you would also have non-developers on the team. So hopefully that we can sort of make the bridge there somehow. But yeah, it's a good thing you point out, yeah. I was told to wrap it up, but... Um, I don't know if Tom wants to give the microphone to anyone.
I'm trying to imagine uh, um, what, what would happen in the, long, in the long run, because I think the UI team uh, would be very important to set the rules, because uh, there are many artists who may help in consistency or may help in uh, designing something that maybe is not exactly what is really needed or what is really um, useful in, in having the big picture in mind. So maybe the, the Y team should have the, um, the ability to drive people, trying to understand what is really needed, starting from what they think. Because this is a very huge problem. Uh, I found many times uh, trying to, you know, uh, to give something to the Blender community, a way to explain what I'm looking for. And sometimes what I ask for uh, um, seemed um, specific stuff. But in fact, it wasn't. So this is very difficult for a user, from a user point of view to explain exactly what he's trying to, no, to, to find. So maybe the UI team has to help people understand how to ask stuff. I know, um, it's, it, it's a bridge. I mean, uh... I mean, you, yeah, you need to somehow talk to a developer who knows about this part of Blender, and then they can explain it to you. But um, like, it's like we don't really have, as all developers, we don't really have time to talk to every user about every feature request. But generally, if you know, if you go on IRC or you send a polite mail, you know, we'll try to give you a polite answer. I think. <laughs> I don't fully understand the question. Um, it's, um, I mean, of course, it's, it's really an important point what you say, because it is difficult to uh, describe what you want. I mean, in most of the cases, you should not even do what people ask for. That's because that's not because they think of some kind of solution, but sometimes the problem is much deeper or somewhere else. So you have to discuss this with a developer who can really listen, and you have to talk to an artist who knows how to explain things, and then after a while you might get really good solutions. And uh, yeah, how do you do that online? Uh, yeah, uh, chatting, communicating, tweeting, Facebooking, or uh, etc. And in parallel to that, have conferences. You can have more conferences. That's a German Blender Day. Make an Italian Blender conference. And of course, we have our Open Movie projects, where we can do these things on a more complicated and uh, high-quality level. They really put half a year artists and developers in one place, and they can work together on complicated, interesting projects. Well, that's what I think we can do. So, so did you finish your talk already? Or can I can I pose a question? Press um, one last question. The, the first thing I'd like to say is, um, and to remind all those guys and girls that are here, is how far we have come with Blender. Blender was in for five years before really uh, a software that was absolutely underestimated in my view, and today we are here and discussing on a much higher level how f how we f can further improve this the software. And I think that is really cool. And I'd like to thank all the developers that are uh, putting so much effort into this with a big applause. That that would be my first thing. And, and 
And one last thing, last question I've got for you. That is, when, when I see so many developers developing great features and committing them, um, do you think we need a formalized process that is, um, that is involving the users that are, that are using later these features to uh, approve if you can understand them or, uh, or if you can um, use it the right way? Because most of the time a developer is very near in the code and in the function, so he knows exactly what to do. But uh, for example, when I see the fill holes function that we get new in 2.69, then there is an option called edges, and no one, really, no one in this room uh, knows what this what this means. I know it. I, I tried it, and I looked into the code, and I know it. But it, it's so complicated if you are a user. And and how would we tackle this problem? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, we don't, oh, you have an easy solution. Ah, I mean, the, well, rule number one, and all the f developers violate it, you cannot commit without documents, without describing how things work, preferably a video, nice web page, a complete documented piece of work where your commit is being described. Essential. And because developers don't like documentation, well, we thought, well, we can have these module teams, expand them with artists and users. And the users who are part of a team, they can help with that. They can make sure that when a developer commits something, that it is being documented, or when he commits something which is ridiculous or totally un understandable, then as part of your team, you can say, ah, ah, pa, pa, pa. you have to uh, do something or remove the key or do something to I, make it workable. I already wrote and that's, the mail. So empowering those little units. And we can have dozens of those small units for all the kinds of parts of Blender where people are working on. I think that kind of dynamics will work quite, quite well. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Interface. So we have five minutes break or not? Two minutes.